Psychology has numerous schools of thoughts or perspectives. Some of the main ones that have left their mark historically are structuralism, functionalism, psychoanalysis, gestalt, behaviorism, and psychodynamic. Others have come to importance more recently, like humanistic, cognitive, evolutionary, biological, and biopsychosocial. However, this does not cover all of the perspectives. On this episode from Learning the Social Sciences, we are going to explain these main perspectives in psychology. Structuralism was the first school of thought or perspective in the field of psychology. It focused on breaking down mental processes while analyzing sensations, feelings, and mental images to the most basic elements. It would see how these items would combine with others to create then complex experiences. Structuralists like its founder Wilhelm Wundt and his student Edward B. Titchener used introspection when conducting research using controlled methods. Introspection involves a person looking at their thoughts and emotions inwardly, but still in a controlled and structured way. Vaunt was known for having a highly controlled technique as he had people respond with only yes and no responses when analyzing their thoughts while introducing sensory events. This tied into Vaunt's focus on sensations and feelings. It looked for the underlying structures that tied thoughts and senses together. Titchener was then the one to take the process and focus on breaking down the individual elements of one's mental experience. Structuralism has fallen to the wayside in the field of psychology. However, it did propose three states of consciousness, being sensations, images, and affections. Gestalt psychology looks at behavior and the mind as a whole. It's that perspective that is often associated with optical illusions. Like, you know, that one image where you see a duck, or wait, is it a rabbit? Duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit? Or the one where you have a young lady that also switches into being an old lady. Those images. This perspective states that we look at objects as being part of a greater whole and then see the elements as part of a smaller yet more complex system. One can use the definition of holism to help summarize this perspective. It states the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Max Verdeheimer created this perspective after noticing an optical illusion at a train station involving railway signal lights that appeared to move when they were obviously not. With this experience, he brought in the idea that human perception is influenced by our experiences as sight is just about seeing what is in front of us. As time went on, he brought in specific principles like the one known as closure, which states that we will fill in missing information to create closure to complete the object. So if somebody is drawing a square, yet they don't finish that last line of the four lines, your brain can automatically fill that in so you see the square. Other principles include Pregnat's proximity, continuity, similarity, and common regions. American psychologist William James sought to create a new perspective as he was not satisfied with the rigidness of structuralism and its focus on tests done only in a lab. James felt that one was impacted by their environment. He took this concept and applied it to behavior and examined how behaviors came about in the real world. The main focus of functionalism was to see how a person fits into their environment and how their behaviors or mental activity helps them to adapt to it. For example, if you feel an irritation on the end of your nose, you usually, you know, rub your nose. Or maybe because of that, you sneeze. That is an adaptation according to functionalism. The perspective also looked at relationships between one's mental state and external behaviors. For example, being extremely sad, which is an internal state, can lead one to crying, which is then an external behavior. James also looked at the consciousness and how it looks at its past, 
present, and future to help it adapt and decide on behaviors. It was James who coined the phrase stream of consciousness. Simply put, functionalists look and analyze the purpose of behavior. One of the most recognizable figures in psychology, Sigmund Freud, created the psychoanalysis perspective, which states that everyone has unconscious feelings, desires, memories, and thoughts. Psychologists like Freud believe that psychological problems laid within the unconscious mind, kind of the back of the brain just processing back there, and therapy could help release the emotions or experiences that the unconscious mind held on to. When this happens, it is known as catharsis or an emotional release. Freud proposed that anxiety and depression were caused by conflicts between the unconscious and the conscious mind. He also stated that people use defense mechanisms to protect themselves from the thoughts and feelings within the unconscious. Freud also thought that the mind contained three elements, the id, ego, and superego. These elements communicate with each other and then bring about behaviors. These components add to one's personality as they interact with one another, especially at different stages of life. The id is the one with all of the wants and needs. The ego is the present self, and the superego is kind of like your angel on your shoulder telling you what you should be doing. Although many of Freud's theories have been falsified, some still hold merit today. However, one of the legacies of psychoanalysis is its offshoot, psychodynamic approach. Behaviorism focuses on observable actions or behaviors of humans and animals. Classical and operant conditioning are the most recognizable areas of study within this perspective. Classical conditioning is when a human or an animal like a dog learns to associate two separate stimuli with each other. For example, the sound of the dog food being poured into the bowl will then cause the dog to come running and to start to salivate. It knows that the food is coming. Operant conditioning is when an animal or human begins to associate a behavior with a consequence. For example, if a pigeon pecks at a button and food is released, it will peck at the button again to get more food, and again, and again, and again. You can also then teach the pigeon to do some pretty cool tricks so that it can get some food. John B. Watson and B. F. Skinner are the most noted behaviorists who believed that people learned behaviors through conditioning. Watson's study, known as Little Albert, involved training a nine-month-old baby to elicit fear when exposed to a white rabbit or other furry animals. The experiment was successful but was highly unethical as Watson would hit a hammer against a metal bar after bringing out the furry animal, thus making a very loud sound that would cause Albert to cry. A study should never cause harm to the participant. Another psychologist known for his work with classical conditioning is Ivan Pavlov, as he worked with dogs who started to salivate when hearing a bell before food was given to them. At the time, he was not actually doing a study on psychology and was not a psychologist. It just kind of happened to fall in his lap. The humanistic perspective associated with Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers focuses on the individual as a whole and seeks to help them find their true potential and become self-actualized. The perspective began to find its base in the 1950s as a reaction to psychoanalysis and psychodynamic perspectives, along with also behaviorism. Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs is a theory focused on human motivation involving five different levels. It starts with a person meeting their psychological needs, then they meet the requirements for safety. Next comes the feeling of love and belonging, and then the individual focuses on self-esteem, and then finally they can become self-actualized at the top of the pyramid. Although there are critics of this pyramid, it did change the focus to giving people more ability to control and determine their motivation and their mental health. 
humanistic psychology took environmental influence into account when looking at a person. It did not solely focus on one's internal thoughts and unconscious motivations. This perspective is still seen today in psychology, education, political arenas, and much more. The cognitive perspective analyzes and focuses on the ways people think and how they act. How does one take in information and then process and store it in a way that they can actively retrieve it when need be? Cognitive psychologists analyze our thinking, looking at the process we go through when problem solving and more. Evolutionary psychologists agree with the biological perspective, but focus more on theories like coming from Charles Darwin. Like Darwin, evolutionary psychologists see behavior and mental processes in terms of their genetic adaptations for survival and reproduction. They look at natural selection and see how it has impacted humans, and of course take into account survival of the fittest. Those biological psychologists examine the physical structures of our body substances that may then impact our behavior or our thoughts. They are the ones looking at chemicals within our body to see if maybe someone experiencing depression may be doing so due to a lack of a certain brain chemical. They're going to be looking at the structure of the brain to see if something could be causing a certain behavior to emerge. Sociocultural psychologists look at how the environment we are in may impact our thinking and behavior, and by changing our environment, we may then also change our behaviors and our thinking. For example, they might look at the day in the life of a teenager, starting when they're at home, then going to school, then going to their job, and then going home again. They would see how they may change in the different environments and also what stays the same in the different environments. The biopsychosocial approach brings in three different views to discuss a person's individual development. It focuses on our biological influences. It looks at our prenatal environment, our genetics and hormones. Next, it examines our psychological influences as our genes and environment interact. It looks at our beliefs, expectations, and feelings about how we respond based on our temperament or possibly based on our gender. Finally, the social cultural influences are taken into account as our peers and parental figures influence us in powerful ways. Also, our culture molds us. For example, we may live in an individualist culture or one that focuses more on collectivism. The two viewpoints can impact the way we view ourselves and society around us. This has been a short covering of the main perspectives in psychology. If you have any questions, comments, leave them down below. Always remember to hit that like and subscribe button so you know when we post more content here at Learning the Social Sciences. Bye-bye.